You are listening to No, You're Crazy. My name is Susan Denae. We all have crazy. What separates us is how we choose to deal with it. I'm going to be delivering engaging and actionable tools to own your crazy, treat your crazy, and turn it into your own superpower. I hope that you walk away from this show feeling the power and strength within you. And never forget to enjoy your journey because you are worth it. Welcome to the Know Your Crazy Talk Show. My name is Susan Denae, and I am here to talk about emotional recovery in the raw. Uh, today's show, I'm talking about hope, uh, kind of, I guess, sort of specifically around maintaining hope while you're in a state of, mm, I'm going to say transition. Uh, could be maybe just living uh, where you've just kind of, uh, almost in a way given up, uh, on some things. And sometimes, uh, what I've learned is hope is, um, everything I, so I, let me, I'll just back up and, and let me first preempt this whole thing with the fact that I'm sitting in my she, she, she shack right now. And I've got to be in here and it's buzzing around. I thought it'd be a good idea to leave my door open. Uh, so I don't know. I'm pretty, you know, I'm hoping that uh, my ass don't get stung here in a minute. So we're just going to, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, okay. So hope. Okay. So hope, what, where did the topic of hope come from? Uh, so last week I had had like these two weeks of, um, let's see, not sick for two weeks. Uh, thank goodness it, it wasn't COVID of course anymore. They're saying it's nothing more than a cold who knows, uh, but it wasn't COVID, but it was a nasty cold that really, just depleted me, uh, just on the couch. I don't remember like literally sickness with chest congestion and sinuses and headache. I don't remember being sick like that in a quite, I mean, I don't know. I think I'd have to really think back like three or four years, maybe. And I've had other stuff go on, but not that. So it kind of took me off guard a little bit, uh, but it did pretty much make me just not want to do anything. So, so what happened? So I, so sometimes we get in these positions in life where we lose our motivation or we don't do as much action as we think we should be. So I had an opportunity to spend about two weeks of not operating like I normally would operate. So that means for me, uh, getting up early, uh, working out, uh, maybe working on some content or doing, you know, whatever makes me feel better. Uh, and instead, I was pretty much just being sick. About day eight or so in this, something like that, I was talking to a mentor of mine. And at this point, the head, my head had gone to kind of all or nothing type of thinking about different things I'm doing. Like, you know, just maybe I'm just not going to do this no more. I just, you know, and, and, and I really, it felt real. It felt the hopelessness felt real. And she said something to me, which is what inspired this show. Uh, what she said to me was, you know, Susan, you didn't come this far to stop. And I thought, you know, it just, it kind of gave me that, that jolt I needed to be reminded of how much progress I have made. I, mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes the progress doesn't look good enough to me. Um, I can take my progress and compare it to maybe others' progress. Uh, maybe I see others' progress and I, I think that's what I want. Uh, and I feel really slow and inept on, on my side. Uh, you know, the, the other thing uh, that came up when I was researching hope um, and, and maintaining hope, you know, when over adversity is what a lot of people wrote about um, and research was done around was how do you maintain that? And they said that some people have a trait of hope, which means that when they, uh, they're, they're like the, ha the glass is half full type of person. Uh, they rarely ever uh, are bogged down with no hope. There's always an optimistic outcome in their mind. There's something that's going on within them that in their thinking that they're just really, it's a trait of theirs. And then the other side of it was, if it's not a trait of someone's to just of someone to automatically be hopeful, then it can become a state. And whenever I hear the word state, like changing your state, uh, often 
And we were talking this weekend, we were at a fantastic recovery uh, getaway, a camp out for a bunch of people in sobriety. And we were talking about how important it is in early sobriety uh, when we're just so full of uh, just everything is raw and all you're doing is you're, you're fighting not to pick up or drink or use drugs and everything is overwhelming. And you'll pick up the phone to call that sponsor in, in that world. Usually we will call a sponsor. Not everybody does this in sobriety, but this is my story and my show. So we're going to talk about the way I know people do it. Uh, but you'll call that sponsor. And, and I was talking about, you know, when you take that call from somebody and they're in that mode of just sheer hopelessness and they don't even know if they can get through the next five minutes. And it's about changing their state for them. It's about getting them to get up and move. You know, what are you doing? Where are you at? Distracting them from the impending uh, doom that they've imagined for themselves in that moment. But it's to get them up and moving so that they can separate long enough from that feeling of overwhelm and that feeling of desperation to where they can just refocus. And so it's kind of like a mind game, right? Like you're trying to get them to distract themselves. And so some people have an automatic trait of optimism and then others uh, have to learn to change the state to become hopeful. And one of the thoughts I had when I was researching hope and, and the benefits of hope and how do you maintain hope through adversity, one of the thoughts that I had was, I'm in a, I've gone through periods in my life where I've really always identified with the trait of hope, uh, just always having a uh, trusting feeling that everything's going to be okay. And then I got older. <laughs> like It changed. It was a game changer. Uh, it's almost like I had to learn how to hold that hope. And, and that was my wake up call a week ago when she said that to me. It was, it was kind of like this jolt of you lost hope for a moment. You know, you got down on yourself. You, you started feeling like this is um, fruitless. Everything I'm doing is fruitless. Uh, it, it feels futile. Uh, can you believe like, I think it was like within the last six months, I had to look up the word futile uh, just to have an appreciation for the definition. And pretty much it just means like, it's pointless. You know, I, I, it's futile to talk to this person, for example, because it's not going to, it's not going to amount to anything. There, there, there's no there's no uh, there's no point to it. It's futile. It's futile for me to go back to school because I'm I'm older and, and I don't retain like I used to. Or do you see where I'm going with this? It's, it's futile to uh, clean up the house because it's just going to get messy again. That's all those damn kids do is they spread their crap everywhere and they never pick it up. It's futile. Right. Well, futile is right in there with hopelessness. And when we're wrapped up or when I'm wrapped up or you're wrapped up in the results not being what we hope that they would be, it's a feeling of futility. It's a feeling of hopelessness. And if there's enough days wrapped up in the futility or the hopelessness of the outcome not being what you think it should, uh, it makes life kind of not enjoyable. It makes life more challenging. You know, I fortunately had somebody who woke me up and said, you haven't come this far to stop. And, and I'd like to say that to anybody who's listening right now, if you're facing something in your life right now that's challenging, if you're facing something that, or, or expectations that you've had of yourself, and, and that's gonna lead me into the next discussion around this, but, but you've, you've landed yourself in this, uh, this mindset, uh, and, and maybe it's been a while, maybe you've been in this mindset for a while, but you've landed yourself in this, mindset of, uh, it's just hard. It's hard right now. And I don't know if I can keep doing this. I don't know if I can keep doing this. Um, it, it was pointed out to me eloquently by a close friend of mine about the, uh, close connection between, um, hope and idealization. And to explain a little bit of that idealization is really, um, perfectionism. And how many of you have ever been guilty of perfectionism? I have been so responsible for perfectionism that I don't want to think that I'm capable of it anymore. Almost like I thought I had automatic grace that I could give myself when making mistakes. But when I said it was eloquently pointed out to me, it's because it was being shown to me and explained to me that a result of my hopelessness has been an idealization with an idea 
you know, some, 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 something that I thought was supposed to look a certain way. Have you ever had anything in your life that you just thought this is supposed to go this way? Maybe it's a dream that you've had. Maybe it's a relationship that came into your life. And then it suddenly, or not even suddenly, but it eventually went away. But there was an idealization. There, there was an attachment to the idea that this is the way this is supposed to go. And then when that attachment or when that reality settled in, that it's not going to go that way. Hopelessness set in. Hopelessness set in. And it's almost as if when the idealization, uh, and, and let's just say the, maybe the obsession with the perfection that this is the way this is supposed to look, but when that is what feels like ripped away from us, uh, sometimes we're left with this gaping hole of identity crisis. Like, where did that go? What was that? I thought it was supposed to be this way. And, and, and now I, I'm like, I'm, I'm legless. I, I have nothing below me to hold me up because I identified so much with the idealization that this was supposed to look this way. So have you ever had that? Have you ever had that? Um, if you're in a time in your life where, you know, like me, it's a time of transition. Maybe you're developing new skills. Maybe you're developing new relationships. Heck, maybe you're somebody who's getting sober and, and you're just, you're not quite sure how this is going to look, or you thought it was going to look one way and you find that it's not, it's not looking that way. Uh, what do you do about that? What do you do about that? How do you re in, reinstall, reinstall hope? How do you get back on track uh, with the hope that works for you? And how do you maintain that uh, more often, uh, more consistently is a better word to use. How do we consistently maintain hope? You know, some argue, you know, hope is so, um, oh, what do I want to say? I'll say non-tangible, right? It's non-tangible. And yet, as you'll hear me talk about later in the show, re research has shown the benefits of hope on the body, uh, the benefits of hope for those suffering from critical conditions. Uh, and so there's all kinds of reasons why we should really focus on how can we consistently manufacture hope for ourselves um, and also be the conduit for hope for others. And that's what happened to me a week ago, which is what inspired the topic of this show, was somebody was a conduit for hope that I needed to hear that day that really helped me uh, up my emotional stance, I guess I could say. All right, so if any of that is interesting to you, if any of that peaks in, you know, you're kind of like, yeah, I could relate to that and I'm kind of interested in this, or if you're helping other people maintain hope and you're wondering what kind of tools you could put in your toolbox, then stick around because we're gonna take a brief break. And when we come back, I'm going to be talking about what we can do to consistently manufacture hope uh, so that it keeps on a coming. All right, so thanks for joining. This is the Know Your Crazy Talk Show. I am Susan Denae, and we will be back shortly. Hey, everyone, welcome back. This is the Know Your Crazy Talk Show. My name is Susan Denae. And I am talking about emotional recovery in the raw. Specifically today, the topic is hope and how to remain hopeful during adversity. Uh, the first part of the show, I have simply been talking about the uh, relationship between hope, um, idealization, uh, idealization being, you know, I'm, I can be prone to hopelessness if I have set ideals and idealizations uh, more or less too high, or I'm expecting perfectionism in an outcome. And when the perfectionism isn't happening, uh, which in my mindset or somebody's mindset might just simply mean it's not rolling out the way I thought it should, uh, then I can become hopeless. And so I was sharing a little bit about, you know, being attached to an idealization, being attached to an idea to the point of hopelessness. Uh, because ultimately, you know, if, if an idea changes or, uh, I mean, that was a personal experience of mine. I, I had my, my mind set around a particular path and suddenly that, that path, that dream 
uh, gets uprooted and it doesn't quite look like the way I thought. And then suddenly it be, it, or it became aware, I became aware that some of this hopelessness that I had been feeling uh, was a direct result from, I had a mindset that it wasn't an idea that it wasn't, it was supposed to go one way and then it wasn't. And so then I had to learn how to uh, deal with that and, and continue to deal with that quite honestly. Uh, so that was the first segment talking about, you know, how is hope and hopelessness related to idealization? And then I talked about as we're coming into this next segment, what is the thing with hope? Like, why, why is it so good for us? Why is hope so good for us? I mean, you and I would both agree when we are hopeful, when we are in a state of hopefulness, uh, where, where there is complete faith, and, and I'm going to use the word faith loosely, uh, but purposefully, uh, when we're faithful that everything's going to be okay, uh, you know, that's a warm, fuzzy feeling. You know that that's like, that's, that's the stuff right? Like when I was talking about a week ago when someone was talking to me and, and she said what she did to me about, you know, you haven't come this far to stop. I was immediately overcome with this warm, fuzzy feeling of hope. Uh, like, yeah, you're right. You know, and, and thank you for reminding me of that. And so what are the effects of hope on the brain and on healing and, and healing yourself? Uh, you know, belief and expectation, they're key elements of hope. And written by a Dr. Jerome Groupman, he was a researcher who uh, studied, and he's got a book called The Anatomy of Hope. Uh, but he's, what he talks about is belief and expectation are key elements of hope that can block pain by releasing the brain's endorphins, uh, mimicking the effects of morphine. And in some cases, uh, hope can have important effects on fundamental physiological processes like respiration, circulation, and motor function. Uh, that that that's like a whole physiological change just from feeling hopeful. But I mean, when you think about hope and you think that it is the opposite of stress, often you hear the effects of stress on the body, the negative effects of stress on the body. Uh, you know, I guess there might be some positive effects, but ultimately, you usually we're listening to the negative stuff. And to where hope is having the opposite effect. Hope is probably making our circulation better by calming us down, by giving a sense of relaxation. Uh, he also showed, his research also showed that hope during the course of illness, uh, where belief and expectation, two mental states associated with hope, have an impact on the nervous system, which in turn sets off a chain reaction that makes improvement and recovery more likely. Uh, this process, he points out, is fundamental to the widely known placebo effect which is created by a hopeful outlook. You know, you talk about people taking medications and in one group is given the placebo, there's nothing in it. And the other group's given the actual, you know, test trial drug and people in the placebo sometimes have a greater outcome than those who've taken the actual medication because they have a, they have hope. They have a, a, a thought that this is gonna make things better for them. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing to experience. You know, one of the things I read uh, when I was uh, researching this, uh, and it happened to be on the day when I was feeling really down, but I was reading uh, a post and it was a gentleman who had been diagnosed with cancer and it was pretty aggressive. And he was in his post, he was stating how that he was going to, you know, lose his hair and he was going to be physically weak. Uh, and, his, you know, and he was really concerned about having to tell his children who I believe are small children, probably under the age of 10, based on the nature of the post. And I think maybe even one was even probably below the age of five. And my heart just went out to him as I'm reading this post, you know, this father who has his whole outlook and his whole life ahead of him. And then suddenly this diagnosis comes in from nowhere and he has to go home and actually tell his children about what they're going to be witnessing and what they're going to be experiencing. And his one daughter, a uh, little girl, uh, came up and sat on his lap and, and she just looked at him and she said, well, I guess you're just going to have to figure something out. I guess you're just going to have to figure it out, dad. And, you know, she was refusing to accept any sort of negative uh, outcome. And in his post, he continues to go on to say that in that moment, there was no other decision but to live. In that moment, he knew that his decision was going to be to live and to not be concerned with any other type of outlook because his little girl had just given him hope. And, and that's the beauty of hope. And, and, you know, I don't know if you, you know, listening to that story, if that personally resonates with you or not, but 
you know, in those moments like that, and in the moment I shared that I had, you know, the effects of hope on us and what that can do for us emotionally, intrinsically, physiologically, um, it, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And it can also feel, uh, you know, let's get addicted to hope, right? You know, and, and even as I was preparing for the show, I was thinking about, uh, like today, uh, you know, you're out here, I'm out here, I'm, I'm live show, and then recordings get posted. And, and the state of affairs in our world right now, uh, things that have recently happened within the last few weeks that are just absolutely devastating. Um, and how do we as people remain hopeful in all of that and not get bogged down when the outcomes seem to be overwhelming at times? And, you know, when people are really uh, scared and they're really bothered by what's going on in the world, you know, I always like to think that, especially if, if you partake in social media or if you're looking at posts around these type of events, you know, people are really, uh, I always see the positive, uh, people really coming to the forefront and being the supporters of that. And that is where our hope lies, right? With one another, with the people who are, are hoping for the better outcomes, who are saying that, you know, yes, change needs to be made, but, but they are advocates. Um, so they're remaining hopeful during the storm. Uh, you know, because hope, hope is a liminal experience, right? It's temporary. Uh, it, it's kind of like um, enthusiasm, you know, bring enthusiasm to the game. Uh, but to remain enthusiastic, that takes a little bit of dedicated effort. Um, I always like to say when it comes to faith, and, and I'll throw hope in this category, you know, how long has it been since I practiced intentional faith? How long has it been since you practiced intentional hope? Or have you become so mired down in the circumstances in which you found yourself uh, that you're having a hard time seeing hope on the other end of that? Uh, I had a, uh, a fantastic woman I was talking to this weekend. She made a decision for coaching. And what was really cool about the decision was, uh, well, I mean, she asked me to coach, so that was cool. But, but what was really cool, what I really enjoyed uh, when she, afterwards, she said, I made the decision. I'm so looking forward to this. I'm so looking forward to change because I just feel, I feel stuck. I feel stuck. And so here she was taking responsibility uh, for her hopelessness, for her stuckness. And, but seeing the light turn around for her and to see her lighten up and be like, I'm hopeful again. Like, like I, you don't have to do this alone. You know, you don't have to do this alone. Uh, so. What am I going to go on to next? So how do you remain hopeful when the road seems so long? How do you remain in a state like of willingness to stay hopeful? Uh, one, are you open to hope? Are you open to hope? You may not be open to hope. You might be living in so much misery and so much regret uh, and turmoil that it's almost impossible to feel hopeful. You know, but it's a decision. It's a decision. Um, and when the mind is telling us that I don't even want to make that decision, uh, that's us, right? Like we have, we have the power to overcome that thinking. We have the power to overcome that and to make decisions that are going to be uh, hope based. And so what do we do? What do we do? So how do we remain hopeful when the road seems too long? I'm going to start on this topic and then we're going to take a short break and we'll be back and I'll continue with it. Uh, but one Okay, so I'm just going to, I probably shouldn't even go off on this tangent right now, but I'm going to, uh, because we're probably going to go to break and it'll probably be a good idea that I get shut off because, um, where are we at? Okay. All right. All I got to say before I go to this break is I went online and when I was doing all this research, I come across all these different blogs about hope. And I got to tell you, everybody's got opinion about how to solve hope. Everybody's got an opinion, at least the people I was reading, and they're all different. They're not the same. They're like all these different strategies. So there's no so shortage of solution for developing a hopeful mindset. I, that I can tell you. Um, but there were some things that I kind of, I didn't like. And I'm going to go over some of those too that I think, um, I don't know. I don't necessarily think that focusing on your pain gives you hope. But some people do. I don't know. I don't necessarily think that looking at turmoil and tragedy um, 
it can inspire hope, I guess. All right, I'm going to stop. We're going to go to break. And when we come back, I'm going to talk more about how do you maintain the hope, actually get into the action tools. I'm going to share openly those tools that other folks have suggested, because just because I don't like them doesn't mean that you won't like them and they might help you. Uh, and, And then we'll just, yeah, we'll have more discussion on hope and what to do about that and how to embrace it, develop it, whatever. All right, we'll be back. Hey everyone, this is Susan Denae. You're joining the Know Your Crazy Talk Show where I am talking about emotional recovery in the raw, uh, specifically today, the topic of hope. Um, How do you maintain hope through adversity? Or rather, really, how do you maintain hope consistently in your life? I think we all get bogged down with uh, circumstances that are not to our liking. I mean, isn't that how we learn? You know, it's kind of like the don't touch the hot stove and then you touch the hot stove and it burns like hell. And you're wondering, well, what am I going to do about that? And I don't know. I mean, that's how we learn. Right. And so the, um, so talking about hopelessness and, and, and hope. And in the first segment, I was talking about the uh, relative, the relationship between hopelessness and idealization uh, attaching to an ideal. And then the ideal not turning out like we'd want idealization is ultimately perfectionism. Um, and then it not turning out the way we want it to turn out. And so therefore we end up feeling hopeless. Uh, and then uh, I talked about the physiological effects of hope and, and how there was research done uh, showing that the positive outcome on the body and the brain uh, can simil- similarly affect us like morphine. Uh, it can be a very lovey-dovey feeling. I'm just going to say, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm a recovered addict. So anything like morphine comes to mind. It's like, oh, that's lovey-dovey. Uh, gotta, I guess you got to be one to know one. Um, but anyway, uh, that hope can do that. So, I mean, hell, if hope can do that, sign me up. Um, but they're talking about the effects on the body, uh, that how it can be uh, good for healing. Uh, some of the research done was also done with uh, pediatric. Uh, I didn't mention this in the show yet, but it was. Um, a pediatric ward, children recovering from, uh, and no, it was, I think they were in their final stages, but how hope was helping them uh, to actually really just live that journey that was remaining for them. Um, And so now I'm going to talk about, so how are some, what are some of the things that you can do to become hopeful if you are down in the dumps about anything in your life emotionally? or you're feeling overwhelmed, or you're feeling like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Some of the women that I work with, often what I hear is they feel lonely. Uh, Loneliness can trigger a a series of emotions. Uh, It can feed into self-pity, no motivation to go out and do things. Uh, it It can kill the creativity of ideas on how to get out and do things. Uh, it can zap away our self-esteem, uh, make us so we feel like we don't want to actually ask people out to go do things. And that's just loneliness, right? That's just loneliness. Uh, so how do we maintain hope uh, when we're dealing with life circumstances and conditions that we're not always feeling lovey-dovey about, right? Like, how do we do that? Uh, one of the things that is suggested, in, and this is something that we've also learned in the rooms of recovery, is community. Uh, and surrounding yourself around people who can lift you up, who are on a similar, they've had similar experiences. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I get mixed, I get mixed reaction from therapists that I know about support groups. Some are into it and some aren't. Uh, I'm obviously an advocate of it because it benefited me so much in my sobriety, being around other people in recovery. Uh, but that ability to consistently show up to a, a group of individuals who not only have overcome obstacles in their life, but they continue to strive for new levels of peace and happiness and what that can do for you in your mindset. Uh, Because, you know, we're not always in the same place at the same time, but listening to someone who's got something that you want and knowing that their story um, has shown that it's possible can give us hope. Uh, Sometimes it can give us hope in weird ways, like well, it's not that bad. You know, it can give us this, this false sense of not even a false sense, but it can give us like this validation that, you know, if they can get through that, I can get through this. Uh, And so support groups and surrounding yourself uh, with people who have, have been there and done that, but now have, have gone on to the other side. 
you know, and what I mean by that is they are becoming the, um, what was the word I wrote down earlier? Give me one second here because I really liked it. I want to say conduit. They are the conduit of hope. And so when you find yourself around people who can be the conduit of hope, the ones that can lift you up when you need it, um, that takes a certain willingness to find those people, right? And so it's a tool and, and it will take some consistency to get there uh, as far as you being willing to seek out those groups. But there's pretty much groups for everything now. Um, I was on a, a call this morning. It was a, um, a platform, a software platform, I guess you want to say. Anyway, and they were talking about the tools of this particular platform is to grow your community. And they were talking or they were sharing about how there's communities everywhere for everything. You've got tech communities and you got, I mean, obviously sobriety communities, but you've got writer communities and you've got writers specifically dealing with tech problem communities. Uh, so there's a lot of support out there and that's in an online format, but trust me, they're, they're in person also. So those are one of, that's one of the things you can do and probably a very effective tool for you is to find others who are a conduit of hope for you and you in turn will be a conduit of hope for others. And that will help you feel hopeful. Um, you know, hope is made up of two things. This is something I wanted to talk about also. Uh, so another, th recognizing that hope is composed of two components, an agency thinking. And what agency thinking is, is it's the motivation to initiate and sustain actions to achieve goals. Don't we all feel better when we've done some action and we've done some goals. And, and what I learned in this process was simply the feeling of accomplishment can give hope. And I think that's important to keep in mind, especially when you're emotionally recovering or if you're someone who battles depression or mental illness or something that feels beyond your control, that even acknowledging and keeping track of your accomplishments throughout the day will help you have a trust and a faith that this is okay, like I can get through this. But it's also, remember that idealization I talked about? Um, it's also about accepting that what you're capable of right now, uh, rolling into an acceptance about that. So for example, uh, I'll use my own personal life. Uh, when I A few years back when I went through some uh, depression and some grief around my father dying and, and some extenuating circumstances that I just wasn't quite you know, isn't it, isn't it right? Like life just throws some crap out there at us every now and then. And we, and we think we've got to hold on this. And then suddenly we realize, nope, nope, I'm, I'm really hurting. Like this one tested me. And, and that's what that experience was for me. Uh, so I had to learn to throw out the idealization of what I thought my life was supposed to look at at that point, because at that particular journey of my, my story, um, I was at a rock dead bottom professionally with the day job, like I was done, but I couldn't leave. And then I had these extenuating circumstances I was dealing with. And then the body on top of it was experiencing some hormonal changes. And so I was really in a tough spot. I had to learn to throw out the idealization of where I thought I was supposed to be, where I thought it was supposed to look like, where I thought it was supposed to be. And I had to get humbled with the idea of simply being able to get up in the morning and make my bed. Yeah. And then I had to give myself credit for that. And so when you go from, oh, I, I think I'm supposed to be educating myself and, and learning about these things and, and doing all these social posts, and I want to be a writer and blah, 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 um, or, or even feeding my kids. And, and then suddenly you're, you're sunk down into a deep grief or depression, lowering the idealization of what you think it's supposed to be and really focusing on acceptance of where you're at. And then acknowledging the accomplishments throughout the day. It's like, for example, are you having, you know, maybe, maybe this week you, you had a rough day. If you really went back in that day and you looked at all your accomplishments, you'd probably have a list. Like, it's amazing the things that we get done when we think that we're not really capable of much. Like, it's amazing. And, and so we just don't give ourselves enough credit. So that would be the next suggestion I would make is make sure that you're giving yourself credit. Uh, for what you are doing. And if you're feeling like you might have some idealization going on where the hope or the expectation of what this is supposed to look like for you, that might need to be lowered a little bit so that that serenity level can come up for you. 
Uh, so that would be uh, the next thing. So I got onto that whole tangent with agency thinking. So it's the motivation to initiate and sustain actions to achieve goals and then experience a sense of accomplishment, right? Experience a sense of accomplishment. And then the next one is pathway thinking, which is the capacity to find ways towards achieving those goals. It's the capacity to find ways towards achieving those goals. Um, one that works really well, and this is one that, that I have practiced numerous times, especially since that experience I just shared with you, was instead of me uh, shaming myself for not having the energy to do what I thought I should do, I would simply get quiet and ask myself, what do I feel like doing? What do I feel like doing? And yeah, it may not, you know, this is probably one of the reasons why I had this little brief resentment against uh, motivational, uh, you know, burn it from, you know, morning to night stuff, because when you're in a funk, dude, you are not burning it from morning to night and to watch those videos and to think that that's going to happen. I mean, it's a, it's a thing. Um, and so what I had to get um, accustomed to um, was getting quiet and asking myself, what do I feel like doing? And when the answer would come back, I mean, literally, I, I did this today. I did this today. I sat in my shack. I pulled out all my old content because suddenly I was going to do some stuff. And then I hit this bump emotionally and I had to sit in my shack and say, what do you feel like doing? And you know what came back? Not a damn thing. That's what came back. I don't feel like doing a damn thing. I, I don't want to, I don't want to pick up anything. I don't want to look at anything. I don't want to make a course. I don't want to make a video. Like I don't do a damn thing. And then what? So, so how do you pull through that and, and not go down the, uh, the tunnel of shame? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you some more tools as soon as we get back from break. Uh, so I'm Susan Denae. You're watching the Know You're Crazy uh, talk show. We're talking about emotional recovery, hope today. I uh, hope to see you here in a few minutes because I'm going to continue on the list of solutions for you. Be back. Hey everyone, this is Susan Denae, and you are watching the Know Your Crazy Talk Show, where we are talking about emotional recovery, or I'm talking about emotional recovery in the raw today. Uh, in particular, hope and how to maintain hope through adversity, how to consistently manufacture hope for yourself. Uh, we've talked, I've talked about anything from hopelessness related to idealization, perfectionism type of thinking, having to reset the idealization uh, to be more realistic to uh, for you so that you can get a sense of accomplishment. That was what I was talking about before we went to break. Uh, you know, what are the tools that we can do to feel hopeful again? Uh, sometimes it's literally about resetting the expectation that we've placed upon ourselves. I've done shows on that in the past. Uh, but becoming comfortable with whatever that is. I was given a couple examples of my own experience uh, when I went through some pretty serious depression and grief a couple within the last couple of years and having to really become comfortable with what was in front of me and doing the next indicated thing. But not only giving myself permission to do the next indicated thing, but giving myself credit for doing the next indicated thing because the next indicated thing might just be making the bed. Uh, and, and I was talking about even today, I was in my shack and I had this moment where I had pulled out all this content. Now I'm not talking, I'm not talking like, I mean, do you ever like bite off more than you can chew at times? Like you got a good idea and you're going to get it all out. Okay. Like you're going to, you're going to rehab the house or, or you're going to clean out the closet. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in this project and you're like, okay, I bit off way more than I could chew. Well, that was me today in the shack. So I've been sitting here, pulling out all my content, all my notes, all my stuff from like five years, six years of doing this stuff. And now I'm going to organize it. Right. And then I sit down and I, I, I get this, um, man, I don't know. I told my friend that I, I, had, I, I'm off sugar like the second day. And she's like, oh yeah, I think that's definitely having an, and like, yeah, I know, you know, neurologically, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, but I had this moment where, I had to like stop it and, and do what I had just said before we went to break, where I had to really ask myself because the motivation wasn't there for what I intended to do. And so now I have this expectation, right? And, and now I got to learn to reset that ex expectation in the middle of my project so I can be happy, I don't know, with me, 
And so I just paused and I said, okay, what do you feel like doing? And, and this is that, this is where I was at before break is when we put too much pressure on ourselves, um, that can absolutely result in a feeling of misery. It can result in uh, hopelessness. And so resetting and pausing and then asking myself, what do you feel like doing? Like, what do you literally feel like doing and being okay? Because you'll answer that question. This isn't some type of meditation trick where the universe is going to, you know, or, you know, deceased relatives going to pop in there and give you the idea. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, the answer to that, either you feel like eating a chocolate bar or you feel like taking a walk or what happened to me today. I didn't feel like doing a damn thing. I didn't want to do anything. And I thought, well, how long is this feeling going to sit here? Because this is kind of screwing with my motivation right now. And I've got all this paperwork in my shack now, and I don't even want to clean it up, right? I mean, if I took this camera right now around the shack, you'd laugh. So I just sat there until it passed. And, and it took, I'm not kidding you, it took about an hour. Uh, and there, it, it literally, it, it, I, I shared a, a post earlier that a gentleman had posted about his little girl saying, you're just going to have to figure it out. I wrote it on my board. You're just going to have to find a way. And that was my shift today is it's like, you're just going to find a way, Susan. You're just going to have to find a way. Like that's all there is to it. And pretty soon, you know, some other things started coming down that I felt like doing. So I took the dogs for a walk. I mean, that's what this is about, right? Like, you know, this isn't, you know, I would love to say, Hey, sign up for my online course right now. And I'll teach you all about hope. Oh, and I'm sure I could put together a great online course about hope. And maybe I will someday, or I could put together, you know, an emotional recovery online course, but you know what? It's real simple stuff, guys. It's real simple stuff, but you have to be willing to interrupt the uh, cycle of negative thinking in the moment. Um, and you can sign up for courses all damn day, just like I have in the past. And sometimes they don't help. Sometimes they do. But, you know, what else can we do? OK, I'm going off on tangents. All right. So positive reflection on what you're accomplishing. So whatever it is that you're accomplishing, whether that's making the bed, doing the dishes, uh, doing an online course, uh, maybe that's the big stuff. Maybe it's washing the car. Maybe it's getting that promotion, whatever it is, but positive reflection on what you are accomplishing versus focusing on what you're not accomplishing. That will help with hope. Here's one. Here's another one. Um, laugh. I mean, just laugh. I mean, doesn't laughter bring to you the idea that all is well? You know, this is, um, I, I love when I get somebody who calls me and, and, and I've been the one making the call myself, but, and everything is so serious. Everything is serious. Like you don't understand if you had my problems, this would be serious for you too. And I, I sometimes I just, I just kind of shake them like theoretically. And I say, don't take this shit too seriously, dude. Like all is well, laugh, find something funny to watch. Uh, find some laughter. Uh, and, and, you know, the best one for me on that is, um, you know, TikTok can make me laugh. Uh, that's a quick fix on laughter. Um, stand up comedians on TV can make me laugh. So this isn't, you know, this isn't brain surgery here. I'm just talking. I mean, these are the things that can help you get into a state of hopefulness. Uh, reminding yourself that you know, if you're feeling pretty hopeless, then your assessment of the situation might be off. It might be off just a little bit. Um, so, you know, an honest kind of in the middle of that storm, kind of like today when I was having my moment in my shack and I'm feeling like not doing anything, uh, just realizing that, yeah, this is my favorite. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. Here's what I know. When I get over with this show today, it's done. So whether or not I felt insecure when I logged on here talking about hope or whether or not I worried about content or whether or not I was stuck in my shack today feeling unmotivated, you know what? It's going to pass. And tomorrow's going to bring a whole other day, a whole other day of experience that I'm either going to uh, do my best to embrace or I'm going to get down in the dumps about. So there you go. OK, so here's some things because we're going to be wrapping up here. Or I'm going to be wrapping up here pretty soon. So here's some things I found online. So I went off on a little tangent earlier about other, everybody's got an idea for how to cure hope, I guess. Um, and I was finding that out when I was doing my research. Um, so the ones I gave you are from personal experience. So me too, I have my own, I have my own solutions. Uh, but here's one. One, one woman said, uh, reflect on your pain. Let me finish it because yes, I judged that right out of the gate. I judged that uh, pain as our teacher, like understanding that the emotional pain you're in can be teaching you something right now. Uh, that can bring hope, according to her. Um, I did like this phrase, metabolize your pain. I, I like the phrase, I don't really know about hope, but um, 
relinquish your victim mentality. Um, that's how she put it. Uh, I might say, honor your accomplishments, you know, honor uh, who you are, embrace the positive about you, um, relinquish your victim mentality. I don't really know if I'm, po if I'm capable of that when I'm hopeless. Um, let's see. Uh, boy, this is horrible. I'm, I'm really refuse to give up. That's a good one. I like, I, in my opinion, refuse to give up. Uh, that's what was said to me a week ago. Understand that where you're at right now, um, you didn't come this far to just get dropped. You know, in recovery, we like to say, God didn't bring you this far just to drop you now. Like you're making it, you're making tremendous headway. Uh, if you're listening to a show like this or any other show like this, then you are already tapping into a willingness to find another solution. Just do yourself a favor and take it to the next level and make sure that you take whatever the recommendations are, are to heart and do some action about it, because that's really when the pain is going to alleviate. Um, uh, stay positive. That, that can be easier said than done, um, but I can appreciate where they're coming from on that. Effortful optimism. Uh, this might be one, if you've been in a state where you haven't been feeling very hopeful lately, um, and you're feeling kind of overwhelmed or like, God, when does this stop? When do the, when do these, like, I've had this feeling over the last couple of years, like when, when does this lift, right? Really ask yourself, have I been remaining optimistic? And if not, do I need to write down some, some things that are optimistic? Do I need to look and, and enforce myself to have a positive outlook on some of these areas of my life? Where in my life am I not feeling hopeful? And have I really taken a look at that to ask myself, is the story that I'm telling myself, is that story absolutely true? Is that true? Are the circumstances as dire as I make them out? You know, um, I was reading a, um, and, and we talk about this all the time, but grace and allowing yourself to have enough grace that, you know, you'll have a bad day every now and then. It's just going to happen. That's life. Uh, and if you don't take it too seriously, but you can appreciate and understand that this too shall pass, it will pass. Uh, and there will be some required effort on your side if it doesn't pass often enough for you. If it doesn't pass often enough for you. Uh, can you be the conduit of hope for somebody else? Maybe it's not all about you. Maybe it's about you finding a solution to your problem so that you can then be a conduit of hope for somebody else. So we're coming, I'm coming to a close of the end of the show. Uh, the main thought I want to leave you with today is if you're feeling hopeless, remember that this too shall pass. Uh, remember that you've accomplished many things today. You've accomplished many things over the last week. Uh, find a resource or somebody who has what you want and listen to what they have to say. Uh, one of the top suggestions was finding a community of people who can help you with that. Uh, that's a great place to start uh, and give yourself accomplishment, uh, with your goals. And even if that's making the bed or doing the dishes, uh, it's a great way to live. Uh, so thanks for joining me today. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, you can go to my website at susandenee.com. It's D E N E E. Uh, or you can just Google know you're crazy. They've done a great job with my website. It'll just take you right to me. Uh, my email's on there and feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to chat. Um, and I got asked this weekend when I got hired for coaching, do you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? And I thought, hell yeah, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and corporate coaching and everything else in between. Uh, so if that interests you, uh, feel free to reach out to be more than, be more than happy to uh, go over to you, go over with you the options. All right. Have a good evening, guys. Bye. You have been listening to Know You're Crazy. 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 And my name is Susan Denae. We are identifying, understanding, and treating your crazy one episode at a time. Tune in to transformationtalkradio.com. To connect with me or Growth Spurt Your Life, please visit susandenae.com. That's susandenae, D-E-N-E-E.com.